Hi, and welcome to the CIPD Central London event, Organisation Development Skills for HR Practitioners. My name is Garen Rauch and I'm joined with my colleague Danny Bacon and we're from Distinction Business Consulting and for the next 90 minutes we're going to give you a really practical guide if you're looking to get into organisation development or just to use it as part of your practice. So um, throughout the session we're going to be sharing 10 tools with you and that you can apply immediately. So one of the tools that we use quite regularly is something called a check-in and that's to help you transition from what you were doing previously, so probably uh, in work, to today's session. So the question that we're going to use for check-in today is if you were a body of water, what would be a good analogy for you today? So if you were a body of water, what would be a good analogy for you today? Would it be calm lake, fast flowing river, rough seas, babbling brook, crashing waterfall, murky pond, or something else? So if you wanna just introduce yourself in the chat and just put your uh, description in there of which kind of water you are, uh, then uh, if you just put it into the chat, that'd be great, thank you. So as we said, this is a CIPD Central London event. Danny and I are both members of the CIPD. Um, and one of the things that we use CIPD for a lot is because we do a lot of evidence-based work. So we actually do a lot of research on academic journals. Um, and so we'll often use the EBSCO site uh, that you can find on the CIPD website. And it's just really good value and great insights on there as well. So to keep up to date with all the CIPD Central London events, um, just scan this QR code and that'll take you through to the Eventbrite site. We're running events throughout uh, 2022, 23 on a whole range of different areas. So that takes us to today's session. So Danny, would you like to introduce us? So Garen and I are really happy to be with you this evening um, to talk about organisational development and how HR practitioners can take some of the skills and knowledge from the field and really weave it into their work. So we don't really need to tell a group of HR professionals that the world of work is changing. We're on the sharp end of that change day in, day out. We've seen huge amounts of change in the last few years and there's more to come. The world of work is going to continue to change and, and at an ever increasing pace. So industry 4.0 is on the horizon and a reality already for some organisations. That's large scale automation and digitalization of processes underpinned by things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there's never been a greater need for a progressive, sophisticated HR professional who can support their stakeholders to achieve strategic objectives and respond to that future challenge and opportunities in a really sustainable way. So HR professionals are finding themselves on the front line, helping their organisations and their leaders um, drive things like technology absorption, uh, fostering innovation, enabling new work models, and ultimately attracting, retaining, and developing the workforce of the future. And there are, there are elements of the OD field that can be really useful to HR to support them in this endeavour. Some of you will be doing this already, and for others, it's going to be more unknown. So today is all about unpacking OD a little. So how can HR use OD to support their organisations to deliver results? By the end of today's session, you're going to have 10 OD tools that you can apply immediately in your work. We're going to give you access to two free playbooks to better support decision making in your organisation. And we're going to give you some starter actions to get you up and running. So before we get into the meat of the session, we're just going to give you a bit of a, an overview of ourselves. So Garen and I are two halves of distinction and organisation development and design consultancy. So we specialise in organisation effectiveness. And we do that by looking at strategy, decision making, working with leaders, team excellence and, and senior teams. We're currently working with um, clients in finance, pharmaceuticals, professional services, the charity and not-for-profit sector, clean energy and even space technology. So our, our portfolio is really varied and interesting. So I'm Danny. Um, I'm a people and organisation development consultant. I was formerly director of people and business services at Investors in People. And my background is in change and project management. I spent 15 years leading remote and hybrid teams in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors. Garen, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Garen. Um, I'm an organisation development and design consultant like Danny. I've been one for over 17 years now. And in that time, not only have I been sort of practised in the UK, uh, but also worked in countries like uh, China, Australia and across Asia, Asia Pacific as well. Um, I've got a master's in organisation development and I'm also I'm a chartered fellow of the CIPD. I'm co-chair of CIPD Central London uh, in that evening job. Uh, and I'm also as part of the drive just to really sort of take OD to to the front of everyone's mind and just how important it is. I'm also chair of the CIPD London Organisation Development Group, and we run events throughout the year to raise awareness and build the skills of practitioners in a range of different OD areas. We're going to kick off with an introduction to OD and how it works. Then we're going to look at how you can be an effective business partner using OD skills and, and tools. 
We're going to look a bit at, about organization systems, what they are and how you can shape them. And then we're going to get, as we said, lots of tools to help you build your OD toolkit. So in terms of getting the most out of this evening, we'd really encourage you to add questions to the chat box for Q&A at the end. Try and think about scenarios you're working with as we talk to you about concepts and models and tools and see how you can apply them. Um, take use this as an opportunity to pause and take time out to reflect on, on what, what's going on for you at work. Um, take a, a time out from your busy, busy day and capture your reflections. We'll share the slides afterwards so you don't need to kind of capture everything we talk about, but just capture your reflections as you as you go through. And we also want to invite you on Friday, we're launching a new scorecard um, called OD Skills for HR. Um, it's a tool we've developed for some of the cohorts of people going through our programs and we're launching this on Friday to, to the wider audience so if it's to our newsletter subscribers so if you fancy um, being able to assess your OD skills against the kind of elements we're going to talk about today then just sign up to our newsletter you can use the QR code there and we'll, we'll show that a bit later on as well but if you're a subscriber to our newsletter by Friday then you'll get access to these tools. And then because it's a CIPD event, we just sort of signpost you to the CIPD profession map. Um, under the specialist knowledge element, there's a whole area of organizational design and development um, criteria there. So some of the things you'll hear tonight, you'll be able to map across to the profession map. So we're just going to launch a book because we're really curious to find out where you are um, in relation to your journey in OD as well. So I'm just about to, um, to launch the poll. Um, so just bear with me one second. So what best describes your current role? Um, so is it HR, is it L&D, is it internal OD, is it you're a student or an external consultant, or is it something else? So please comment um, in the uh, uh, chat. Uh, and the second question we've got for you, what best describes your experience of organization development? So it's something I'm just curious, I'm interested in, I'm actually involved in some OD projects, I actually regularly practice it in my role or other, please comment. So we're just really curious to find out where you are right now. Um, the numbers are going up really nicely. So as soon as we hit about 70%, we'll close the poll. So it's just flying up. Um, so uh, very well represented with HR today, which is great. Um, lots of people that are interested in it. Um, we've got a few um, uh, people that are external consultants. Um, yet don't worry about the QR code. We'll, do is we'll make sure if you don't capture it, you'll capture it on the slides afterwards as well. Great. So we've hit 81%. So we'll just um, close the poll and share the results. So 57% of you on the call tonight are HR, 9% L&D, 12% um, internal OD, 5% of you are students, 13% um, external consultants and 4% other. Um, and what best describes your experience of organization development? So 43%, I'm, I'm interested, I'm curious about it. 31% have had some involvement in OD projects, which is really interesting. So a nice base of understanding. 22% um, are regularly practice it and 4% others, please comment. So just gonna stop sharing. So all of you are welcome. And, and no matter where you are in that journey, hopefully there'll be some value for this, um, for this session tonight for you as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Let's get into it then. So the first part of this evening is going to be about introducing you to organisational development and how it works. So, you know, basic question, what is organisational development? So if you're new to the concept of OD, then it can sometimes feel a bit hard to unravel what OD is exactly. There's lots of definitions out there. We've got a few on the screen. I'm not going to slavishly go through them. When you get the slides, you can read them at your leisure. And there's more if you want more. We can, oh, there's, we can provide. there's hundreds. There's, there's a lot. <laughs> And it can often feel there's as many definitions of OD as there are practitioners. So in that spirit, we've got our own definition of organisation development. So in terms of the outcomes that organisational development hopes to uh, achieve, our view is that it's about improved organisational effectiveness in the service of achieving organisations goals. It's better aligned structure, culture and strategy and aligning that with the realities of work. It's about increasing employee collaboration and cooperation. It's about boosting interpersonal trust. And it's about achieving increased levels of satisfaction and commitment of employees. So in terms of how organisational development does what it does, there's kind of five points to make. The first is that it's scientific. So organisational development applies behavioural science and practice to facilitate change and transformation in our organisations. It's systemic. So it treats the organisation as a system and seeks to address the systemic challenges. It doesn't just look at the surface and, and treat the symptoms. It's humanistic, so it puts people at the heart of the process and really values human potential. And that's why I was drawn to kind of the field of OD 
it's participative and inclusive also. So it, it seeks to involve members of the organisation in really understanding and responding to the challenges they're facing. It's not about doing things to people. Um, it's about involving them in co-creating and it's sustainable. So it's very much focused on building capability and skills and knowledge that give people kind of resource people to solve future problems unaided. Great. So let's just look at the foundations of OD. So we're not going to give you a whole historical tour of OD. You know, that's a that's a session in itself. But I think probably one of the reasons why OD is just so varied, you know, even when we meet as a CRPD London group and, you know, when I first was introduced, group, we spent a whole session just talking about what's the definition of it. What, what What's great about OD is it's called the magpie profession. And that means that it takes a lot of the best thinking from lots of different fields in the service of achieving organisational goals, because there's so many things going on in an organisation. It's a system, there's individual behaviour, so some of the elements that it draws on are um, sociology, um, social psychology, systems theory, um, anthropology, um, organization behavior, management theory, of course, um, complexity theory. And biology, interestingly, and even cybernetics as well. So there's a bit of everything. So sometimes that's why it's just such a broad field. And two OD practitioners will be often doing quite different things to each other as well. Okay. So the, the, some of the thinkers, again, if you want to look a bit further into it, there's some, some incredible minds that we sort of stand on the shoulders of all these great thinkers that came in the past. So Kurt Lewin is the, is the founder of OD. Um, uh, Beyond did some brilliant work on group dynamics. Uh, Richard Beckart, he was the first person to define OD, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Um, then we've got um, Eckes Schein, who first looked at, like, really looked at consultancy um, and culture. Douglas McGregor, sort of theory X and Y and motivation. Um, then we've got uh, Maslow, you know, all the things that came in. I can never pronounce Chris's surname. Argris, is it? That's right. And he's yeah. double loop learning. So there's a whole wealth of things for you to read. And all of it is intensely interesting if you want to go that far. But you don't necessarily have to. That's OK. Some of the more recent thinkers that we re regularly use in our work and refer to, um, obviously, Mian Chung Judge, um, unfortunately, passed away very recently, um, is a very respected thinker in the field and brought, brought together a lot of the thinking to make it very accessible. We really love the work of Gervais Bush and things like clear leadership and interpersonal mush, uh, Barry Oshry and his uh, power and systems. Um, some of you are interested in organization design. So Naomi Stanford is uh, is just a living, breathing embodiment of good practice in OD. She's got a whole wealth of very accessible books out there. So there's a whole range of thinkers that we often pull on in our work from day to day. Yeah. A, a good place, if you do want to go a bit further, is uh, Mian brought a, a brilliant book. Most OD practitioners have one version of this on their shelf. I certainly do on my Kindle. I um, do and what it, <laughs> what it is, it's just very accessible, introduced to the theories and a bit of application as well. So if you want to go a bit further, and it's a practitioner's guide, so it's nice and applicable. So who practices OD? So, so this is our belief, and we feel very passionate about this. Sometimes OD can be described as elitist, we don't think it should be. We think everybody should have an OD mindset. So if our organizations were our managers, you know, people at all different levels in the organization have an OD mindset, it would mean that organizations are more coordinated, they're more aligned, they're more humanistic, they're more strategic, and they're more systemic as well. So whether you're an internal OD practitioner, whether you're an HR practitioner, whether you're a manager, whether you're in the public sector or private sector, charity or not-for-profit, that really is OD is something that can hugely benefit you, your work and your organisation as well. Great. Thanks, Garen. So we're going to look a little bit now about what organisation development looks like in practice. So, you know, what can it improve? Where can you apply it? Effectively, you can apply organisational development approaches to pretty much anything that an organisation does that involves people. So some of the typical areas that we work with organisations on include enhancing leadership capability, uh, working with individuals or teams who are in conflict and helping them find more productive ways of working together and collaborating. We support organisations to develop kind of different mindsets and approaches to help them anticipate and adapt to the changing world of work. It's about we support strategic alignment across across the organisation. We might work on change projects and helping people be more people centric and make those more effective. Um, and we did some work around ways of working and, and hybrid working and organisational design as well. So, so how do we do it? You'll hear the terminology intervention, which sounds a bit scary when you talk about organisational development. We often talk about organisational development interventions. It just means different ways of tackling problems and bringing people together. Um, so 
some of those might be large group interventions so we where you bring the whole of the organization or the whole of the the system that you're working with into one room to kind of work through a challenge or an issue it might be about holding workshops or meetings to support teams and individuals to have new conversations and have conversations and discussions they wouldn't have in the normal course of work you know coaching is a an organizational development intervention um whether that be one-to-one -one coaching to help people work through challenges or develop new mindsets or you know look at their beliefs and values or it might be team coaching and you know we we deliver systemic leadership programs which which all fall you know the training and um capability development category so there's a whole host of things that fall into the kind of the od remit so just in chat now we're going to do something called chatterfall so the idea of Chatterfall is you type your answer into chat, but you don't well, press go until <laughs> until we say go. The idea is everybody gets their answers ready. We say go, everybody presses send, and then we can see a stream of kind of answers. So our question for you to get your answer ready in chat, but remember, don't press go. Somebody already always does press press send before we say go. So don't worry if that's you. But our question for you is which of these methods are you using most often in your work at the moment? So get your answer ready in chat. Ready? Steady, go. Okay. <laughs> it works as an activity. Excellent. Okay. Wow. Oh, wow. There's a lot of OD being applied. So conflict resolution, one-to-one -one coaching, lots of process consultation, one-to-ones and group coaching. Wesley is workshop, meeting facilitation, conflict. Brilliant. So lots of application. Uh, yeah, training there. Thank you. Uh, Greg's doing a whole range of different things there. Um, Great. Maria training, conflict resolution. Excellent. So a really good spread in the room. So mm -hmm. great. So we've got a lot of knowledge. So it's not just about us sharing our knowledge today. It's about you guys. Please share your knowledge with each other as well. And you all suddenly have very interesting jobs if you're doing <laughs> those things day in, day out. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to introduce you a little bit of an OD cycle. Um, so it, it's just for some of you to follow as, a, as an HR practitioner, you're obviously all doing different things, but it's just a, a nice cycle to follow um, that kind of means that you know where you stand and you're kind of sort of following sort of um, fairly basic steps. So there's the cycle that we're going to sort of do without giving you too much theory. It's, it's a cross between two different types of OD. See, so two different types of OD are uh, dialogic and diagnostic. So diagnostic OD is where we basically we measure things, we we uh, we create an, uh, like a we assess something, and we have planned change, and we change is incremental, so in steps. And diagnostic change is recognizing that change is often emergent; it just kind of happens and evolves, not necessarily by intention. And the change often happens by different types of talk in the organization itself and that helps people shift their mindsets as well so what we've done is we, this kind of merges both different types together so the four stages in the cycle begin with what we say you um, we'll talk about this in a moment we talk about um, od talks about something called self as instrument um, and it sounds a bit of a, a strange term but daniel will unpack it in a second but it's just the importance of what you are and what you bring to the process and how you are the first stage is engage the second stage is diagnose. The third stage is take action. And the fourth stage is embed and iterate. So let's just unpack each one of those in turn. And this goes around in a cycle. So the first one is engage. So the first thing when you when you start to support your state, and we'll call them stakeholders, you might call them clients or you know teams that you're supporting, is understand the system, understand what it is that you're changing, understand the logic of how it all hangs together. The next bit is to make sure that you're credible. Like as an OD practitioner, we, we can't do our work unless we're seen as credible. And it's whatever credible is in, in your stakeholders' eyes. Making sure that you clarify expectations up front. And that's where a lot of uh, people fall down is that they don't take the time up front to contract and make sure that things are really clear and what the priority is before they start. And taking time to actually define the problem and agree the goals together to make sure there's no misunderstandings and we're all aligned. The next stage is diagnose. So um, when we when we actually are supporting people, we agree up front how we're going to decide. You know, are you going to decide? Are we going to decide? You know, are we going to be inclusive? Are we going to involve our people in the decisions? And then we decide what kind of information we're going to collect and that we then analyze that decision and interpret. And that data could be focus groups. It could be a culture measure. It could be um, engagement survey. It could be a whole range of things. We like to mix a little bit of uh, qualitative and quantitative data to give us a, an all round view. And then we look at things that sort of as assessing opportunities. So where are the opportunities we can make 
quick difference and create value? And where are things like the capability gaps? So if we're working with a team, it's like, so what, what capabilities do they need to develop to achieve that strategy? And then the really important bit is to generate options because the best decisions are made when we have options to decide upon. The next stage is taking action. So the importance is, you know, D is co-creating solutions. So we don't just write a prescription and take two of these. Um, we actually create solutions together. We plan the delivery. We plan the communication to make sure it's inclusive and people feel part of it. Um, we, as all of you will work in, um, uh, we, we work in complex systems. So with those things, um, we often don't know what the outcome of our decisions are going to be until we actually implement them. And so what happens there is we need to test them where possible to see what happens, because often the um, outcomes are often quite surprising and unexpected. And then we implement as well. Stage four is um, embed and iterate. So it's about making it stick. So once we've made the change, what can we do to update our processes, our policies? Um, how can we make sure it's potentially built into the training or our recruitment, whatever move forward to make it stick in the system? And then we review and evaluate how it's gone. Did it produce what we expected it to do? Um, and then we share the learning. So we take time at the end of everything to review and run a retrospective. And then we evolve and iterate for the next time or a continuation of developing as well. Um, Joe asked what's the difference um, between dialogic and diagnostic. So yeah, so um, we'll, we, we'll signpost you to some materials on that as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a really important point in terms of uh, di so diagnostic is basically we, we measure something so if we're if we're doing culture change we'll measure the culture we'll actually use a tool to measure it um, diagnostic is where actually we surface different perspectives through discussion and then we create the change through discussion. But you said diagnostic again I think you meant dialogic the second dialogic time. <laughs> yeah that's it so I've better drink some coffee <laughs> And, and I totally take your point, Annabelle, about the, the challenge of testing it. It's just where possible. We all sort of say fire um, bullets, then cannonballs when you go for a big change. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a proper long kind of piloting process. It can be you, you can do quite small things to test ideas. 100 percent. Yeah. 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 Perfect. OK, so Garen talked about you being in the centre of that cycle. So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about you as an HR practitioner and applying an OD approach. So. As Garen said, if you read some of the literature around OD or you listen to anybody in organisation development, you hear terms like use of self, a self of it, a self as instrument. And I remember when I first started looking at OD and, and attending workshops and things, it just felt like a really alien concept. I couldn't really quite get my head around what, what those things meant. Um, but it's common parlance in OD and I think it's used a lot in things, fields like counselling, social work medical profession but essentially it's all around the idea that you and who you are and how you engage is actually more important than the process or the tools that you use the you as an individual are actually the catalyst for change and your actions your inactions all have the potential to impact the organization you're working with and the people in it uh, without a good level of self-awareness you actually have the potential to do harm um, rather than good irrespective of the depth of your knowledge of frameworks and theories and tools so you can know loads of stuff but unless you know yourself and you've got a good amount of self-awareness and how you're impacting on the people in the system you're working in then yeah that's really important so so when we look at core OD capabilities we've pop our top one is self and situational awareness so having really good understanding of yourself um, relationship building systems thinking and we're going to unpack some of these a bit later on data gathering diagnosis and analysis and as Garen said it's not that's not number crunching so it's not about all about kind of numbers um, data gathering might be just focus groups and talking to people and gathering the qualitative research. Inclusion and participation, being able to build inclusion mm. and participative spaces is really important. And being able to design solutions and implement them um, in a really effective way is, is really important. So that's all underpinned by a solid understanding of OD models and theories and frameworks and a really solid knowledge of the business that you're working in. So building self-awareness. So as we said, building self-awareness is a really important part of adopting an OD mindset in your work as an HR practitioner, but it's not the exclusive domain of OD at all. And it's, you know, it's something we encourage, actively encourage all of the leaders that we work with um, to be a good leader. You need to be have good self-awareness. So in the same way, you need to have good self-awareness as an OD practitioner. And what does that self-awareness look like? So it's being aware of our own values. So what are our, our personal values? What biases are at play? What are our, you know, We've all got biases. You can't avoid it. It's just human nature. And what judgments are we making? 
It's about understanding our own preferences and needs. So what are our needs for power, for approval, for self-esteem, our control needs, because they all, they all impact on how we engage with others. It's being aware of our own emotions um, and our physical responses and reactions to things. So emotional contagion is a thing. So there's lots of research that shows emotions are contagious in, in organisations and in our relationships. So it's really important that we're aware of the emotions we're carrying and potentially transferring on to the people that we're working with. Yeah. And as Danny and I spend a lot of time when we're working on projects talking to each other, because also when you are in HR or you do no D work, people project their emotions onto you. So mm -hmm. they'll see you as the expert and, and or you may sort of they'll project their anxiety onto you as well. So it's really important to be aware of what's their stuff and what's my stuff. So anyone who's been on the front of a redundancy process will definitely know what that feeling is like. So you know, it's, it's really important to be able to name your emotions. Yeah. Part of that building self-awareness is also being able to role model the change you seek in others. Um, you know, you are a, you know, you are probably the one of the most important catalysts for change. If others see you modelling that change, then that's really important. It's about being re realistic of the limits of your knowledge and skills so that you know which situations you can help with and intervene in and make a, a positive difference. And where, you know, if you've hit the boundaries of your limits, your, your knowledge and skills, then you need to make that judgment call about whether you, you step in or it's better to step out and let somebody else um, more qualified or more experienced step in. So it's having a realistic awareness of that. And OD is about having a lifelong learning orientation. The field's so huge, you never, you're never going to finish learning. So it's just about being excited and open to learning um, constantly. Reflection really really important part of self-awareness so that ability to step back in any given situation and look what's gone on um, either in the past or you know how you're feeling about a situation that's coming up and that self-awareness is key to being able to change our responses and reactions to situations so if part of the OD mindset is just constant reflection um, either on your own or with a partner or the way that Garrett and I do when we're working um, so we're going to introduce you to our second tool of the night and that is called the experience cube and it's by, you know, it's developed by Gervais Bush um, and he, he explains it in his book called Clear Leadership. But it's a really great tool for unpacking what's going on for us. and We can use it for, for self-reflection. So it's got four. It, we look at our experiences at any given moment as having four elements. So the first element is observing. So what are we noticing? So what are we seeing? What are we reading? Second one's what are we thinking? So what are we telling ourselves about that situation? The next one's feeling. So what do we feel about the situation? And wanting what are we wanting from the situation so by considering our experience from all four of these perspectives we can gain much greater clarity on what's really going on for us and identifying where we might be filling you know the gaps with assumptions or stories so i think if you think about you know yourself as a an hr practitioner or or anybody really approaching a, a stakeholder you've got a key stakeholder meeting coming up you could observe so you can see what you notice. So what, what is that stakeholder saying and doing? What emails are they sending? What's their demeanor when they talk to you or you talk to them? Um, if you look at feeling, we can think about how we're feeling about that conversation we need to have with them. Are we worried about it? Are we excited? Are we anxious? Then we can have what are we thinking about that conversation or that that's a conversation that's coming up? What are we telling ourselves? Are we saying this is going to be really I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. It's a great opportunity to, to chat. Or are we saying, I'm really worried they're not going to have time to talk to me. I don't think they're going to listen to me. So we'll be telling ourselves a story that may or no, may not be true. And then wanting, what are we wanting from that, that conversation? So are we seeking to achieve outcomes for our organisation? Um, are we wanting their approval? Are we wanting just to avoid conflict? Or I get through it with, um, with a minimum of um, awkwardness. So it's just a really useful tool that you can apply to situations you've got coming up or situations you've been through and they just help you unpack your experience in a more detailed way. Excellent. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're just starting to look at the ingredients of an effective OD practitioner. Um, so what, what we've worked to do and, and sort of you know, being influenced by some of the competency frameworks from the OD network and CIPD. And we've kind of put together like a little bit of a formula that's useful to follow. So it's like this there's, there's four key elements to an effective HR practitioner applying OD. And so it's just being mindful of like, we've all got areas for development and our strengths as well. So where are we on that journey? So if we look at the formula. So it's OD, we love an equation, uh, K plus T plus R plus S. So remember that and you'll be fine. So K stands for um, knowledge and practice. T stands for track record. 
R stands for relationships and S stands for systems thinker. So we're going to unpack each of those ingredients and then you can start to think where you, where you are in relation to those things. And then again, when we launch the, um, uh, the, the score app, um, then you'll have an opportunity to assess yourself against them as well. So the first one is knowledge and practice. So there's kind of sort of five key elements to where you are in knowledge and practice. So, you know, asking yourself, do you know the language of the organization and do you know how it produces results? Do you know how all the different inputs come together and what are the key things in the organization that add the value that lead to people wanting to consume its services? And that really allows you to support the organization in what it needs when it's trying to develop a strategy. The next thing is, do you really understand the strategy? Like, do you really understand it? You know, do you understand the trade-offs? Do you understand the priorities that need to be um, sort of focused on? And do we know the capability? So we know that, so our five-year plan for 2027 is here, but we know that we need, we're here now. What are the capabilities we need to, and how can I help the organization develop those capabilities so they're there in 2027? And are we able to bring alternative perspectives to the organization? So, you know, when you're dealing with operational people, you're, you're dealing with the stakeholders that are in the business, it's really important to bring fresh alternative perspectives in. So, you know, as HR, we spend a lot of time thinking about people and motivation, you know, bring those views in. It really helps people. They're often really consumed by tasks and stuff to do. So bring that perspective in. Don't be shy to share it. And also just having a range of theories you can use to make sense of what's going on. So sometimes we go into organizations and it's chaotic and messy and we're like, oh my God, what on earth is going on here? And then you'll think of a theory and you're like, oh, now it, now it fits. Now we understand what's going on. So it's just, and we'll introduce some theories in a moment that, you can, that are quite useful for making sense of what happens in an organization. And then finally, um, just being able to use a range of tools to encourage productive discussions between individuals, groups and teams. OK, so that's being comfortable facilitating. Don't necessarily have to be large group. That's a great skill to have, but it could be just facilitating meetings, groups um, and also being things like coaching skills as well. The ability to ask coaching questions that challenge people's beliefs and mindsets. Great. Thanks, Garen. So the second element of the equation is, is what we've called track record. So this is about your track record of getting to the heart of issues and co-creating outcomes that matter with your stakeholders. It's about being results oriented and helping the organization win in whatever way win means for the organization. So it's not about profits necessarily. If you're in the not profit sector, there's, there's different measures that will be important there. Third is about being a consistent and positive presence. So do your stakeholders see you around all the time? You're not just helicoptering in when there's a problem. Um, or, you know, when you've got time. So it's about building that relationship and, and people understanding you're going to be there um, consistently and positively. Having a reputation for focusing on the how do we make this work rather than we can't do that or we don't do that. Policy says no. So um, that's really important. Yeah. And it's not about breaking the law. It's, it's just about enabling it. How can mm -hmm. we help you navigate this? How can we make this happen in the most effective way? So people can see you're, you're an enabler. So you, you're absolutely keeping them on the right rails, but just making sure that it does happen. And lastly, your own track records tied up with the team that you're part of. So the track record and reputation of your team in the organisation will impact how you're seen by your stakeholders. So ideally, you want to be part of a wider team that's got a good track record for delivery and being seen as useful and credible because that will reflect well on you. The next one is relationships. So the key, the five key components there is um, making sure that you're able to put people at the heart of process and valuing like human potential. So you're always focusing on helping people develop themselves no matter what. The second one is that stakeholders believe you have the best interests at heart. So sometimes stakeholders have a perception that's often wrong um, about where your interests are, but it's made sure that they have that perception. You're, you're there to support them and help them achieve their goals. Um, and then you're not invited into unhealthy relationships. So often HR is invited into um, unsatisfactory relationships. So parent-child relationships, you're having to tell people off or you're seen as the police or you're seeing people in, in distress and you're the rescuer. So, so OD does its best work when it's adult-adult because it's all about making sure that everyone takes their healthy share of responsibility at the system. And also that you're a critical friend. Now, this is really important and, and sometimes it can be a little bit fear inducing initially, but it's the ability to challenge power and sometimes people that are more senior to you or so people, but it's been able to do it in a compassionate way. So it's been able to give critique 
but understand the pressures that they're under. So they respect you for, for speaking out, but they understand that you, you know, you understand their pressures and why they might be coming there. Um, it's a difficult thing, but it's, uh, again, Steve Hearson, that we're doing this session on the 18th of October, spends a lot of time thinking about that in his work. And also that you feel comfortable promoting autonomy and that it is making sure that your clients take responsibility. It's, there's no learned dependence on HR. It's making sure that you know, they've, they're able to make their own decisions and, and use you as a guide and, and use you as a resource. Great, thanks. So the final part of our OD, effective OD practitioner equation is, is being a systems thinker. So it's about seeing the organisation as a system. It's about looking for root causes and not just focusing on the surface level symptoms. So it's about digging deeper and not being satisfied until you've you've got to the root cause of the situations or the problems that need addressing. It's having an awareness of how authority, power and politics work within the organisation. We're not suggesting you kind of fall into practising kind of political malevolent political behaviour. But if you want to get things done, then it's just understanding the mechanics. How does authority, power and politics play out in your organisation? You need to be cognizant of that to, to interact with the, the system effectively. It's an understanding that the systems are complex and our perspective as an OD practitioner or an HR person applying OD is, is only ever going to be partial and limited. So we can't see everything. A lot of what's in the system is invisible. So it's important that we don't see a part of the system and assume we've seen the whole and make decisions on that basis. Um, and related to that is drawing on a diversity of perspectives. So the more people we can bring in, the better we can understand the system and really understand what's going on. So inclusion and participation is crucial, as is taking the time to think through the impacts of decisions and challenges. So when we're thinking about a, a solution, it's really looking at the upstream and the downstream impacts. How is it going to how is this going to impact on other teams? Um, so we need to think through those things. And as we said, there's the um, the QR code. If anybody can't read that, you can also go to our website and go to distinction.live keep in touch and then you can sign up for the newsletter that way so if anybody's having a problem scanning the code because i think zoom's blocking blocking the bar the uh, the code then just pop along to the website um, and you can you can pick it up off the slides afterwards as well but that's launching on friday if you sign up to the newsletter before then then you'll be able to access it so we've got a quick zoom poll again now absolutely so we've given you lots of input there so i guess what we're looking to do is in which of these areas um, are you uh, strongest and which of the four is your biggest area for development? So we've got those um, different uh, ones there. We've got knowledge and practice, relationships, track record, systems thinker. We've just opened the poll. So have a thought for a moment. You know, which do you think? Yep, yeah, I'm doing those great at the moment. Um, uh, put your comments in, uh, your, uh, thing in there. And then basically, which of the four is your biggest area for development? Is it knowledge and practice? Is it relationships? Is it um, track record? Is it systems thinker? So lots of people completing. It's firing up at the moment. OK, we've gone flying over that. So let's um, open, close the poll now. So and share the results. So 55% um, of you see relationships as the strongest um, element of those four things. So that's brilliant. And, and we would completely expect that, you know, it's a, a very human centered uh, function. Knowledge and practice, 15%, track record, 12 and systems think 18%. And which of the area, biggest areas for development? Uh, the highest one is systems think on 46%, knowledge and practice 27, relationships 13 and track record 13, 15 and track record 13. Excellent. Thanks so much, guys. And so it's thinking about how you want to take that development further. Um, and, you know, systems think it's, it's completely understandable that that would be one of the main areas for people to focus on. OK, so now we're going to turn our attention to how you can take an OD partnering approach to working with your stakeholders. So we've got another model to introduce to you here and you might have seen it already. It shines consultancy roles. So as HR practitioners or OD practitioners or L&D practitioners, we're invited into roles with our with our key stakeholders. And this model helps us articulate what those those roles are. So the first one is being invited into an expert role. So our client or our stakeholder asks us to provide them with relevant information or expertise. Um, we provide the information they lack. So if we're in a kind of expert relationship, then our focus is probably on providing answers. We spend a lot of our time explaining um, the yeah, stakeholder no, receives. <laughs> don't do that. Stop that right now. Don't even think about doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is how you do it. Um, the stakeholder receives information and we're measured really on being providing that information, high quality information, the right answers um, in a timely way. The second consultancy role is doctor patient. So here 
our stakeholder or our client might ask us in to investigate a situation, diagnose what's going on and propose a remedy. So they identify the concern, we propose the solution, then we might oversee implementation. Um, so the relationship is based on needs, it's about business problems, it's about problem solving. The stakeholder receives solutions to their problems and the success indicators are, have, has the problem been resolved satisfactorily? And then we move into kind of the more um, OD end of the, the consultancy role and that's process consulting. So this is where the client and the consultant work together to identify the problem and propose a solution. It's about joint diagnosis. It's about joint development of a plan. And as you work with the client, you guide and educate and challenge them. So for that to work effectively, you need a relationship built on trust. You need to build understanding. And if it works well, you end up in a place where the stakeholder feels you're a safe space for, for working through challenging issues. You're a, you're a good sounding board. Um, and success is about jointly defining the work to be done and you jointly define the success measures. So we are interested Another Zoom poll for you. Which mode do you currently spend most of your time in now? Great. So this is the last poll of the evening. So we're just going to um, relaunch this poll for you guys now. So do you spend most of your time in expert role, doctor patient, process, or actually it's not applicable to my role. So let's re we're really curious about these results. So do you find yourself in expert, doctor patient, process, or not applicable to me? That's it's very neck and neck at the moment. Mm. Nice balance. OK, OK, we've just hit 70%. So I'll just close the poll now. Excellent. And we'll just share those results. So the highest one, which is great, you guys are bang on track, um, process consulting, you know, all of them provide value. It's just, you know, what we're looking at, the focus of attention here is making sure that we're focused on um, the, the OD way tonight. So 34% is process, 31% is doctor patient, 27% is expert, and the other one is not applicable to me. So it's really about you're invited into these roles and it's about whether you accept that position mm -hmm. in that particular moment and if it's the right thing. Okay. So now we're going to look at contracting and managing expectations. And, and this is critical. It's often the, the most overlooked aspect of working with our stakeholders in an OD way. And get this right, and the rest of the work is so much easier and smoother. Um, get it wrong, and you've got the, the ability to you know, have difficulties. So there's a lot of challenges being an HR practitioner trying to influence stakeholders. And, and Danny, you've got, obviously got a lot of experience with that as being a, mm. an HR, you know, a busy head of a busy function in, in an organization. So sometimes it's, the, it's, it's about the perception of HR. It's not how you're doing it, it's just how, please, how people receive the, the, the role of HR. So sometimes it's just viewed as a support role. It's, you know, it's there to fulfill and service us and we just give it commands and it, you know, takes our um, command our orders. Next one is just involved too late. So you find out something's been decided, you're like, oh no, if if only you'd consult to me earlier, we could have navigated our way around that. We could have, you know, avoided that problem. Um, you could be just not involved at all. And sometimes that does happen. It's just, it just happens so quickly. And it's like, it's difficult for the HR person to keep up with what's happening. And often we hear of HR people diary stalking. It's like, so the only way they're finding out what's going on is who's meeting who. Um, or we've got being seen as the police. And, and it does, unfortunately, however, we do hear this. It's where, you know, people say, they sort of see, oh no, here comes HR, you know. Um, and so people don't necessarily involve them because they're, they're, they're concerned about HR might judge them or whatever it is. Um, and this is, again, the challenges that people bring in their own perceptions or the HR seen as soft and fluffy rather than commercial. So they're not really understanding the value that HR can bring. OK. So I guess just a chatter for question for you all. So we're just really interested if any of those are your challenges or if you see any other challenges you face when influencing stakeholders. There's, there's a whole myriad of reasons. I'd be really interested to hear the different ones. So what are the main challenges you face as an HR practitioner when trying to influence your uh, stakeholders? So as it's chatter for, we'll just hold on for a second. And then when we say go, we'll ask everyone just to put it in the, into the um, uh, chat box. So to give you five seconds, five, four, three, two, one. OK, go for it. <laughs> Brilliant. Being involved too late, too late, too late, too late. Uh, moving from short term to long term. Very good. Yeah. Support function. Um, not understanding your role. Yeah. Not involved at all. Too late. Seen as the police. Uh, hard to keep up with managing our workload on top of everything else. Being seen as support. Uh, yeah. People coming up with a solution without understanding the problem. Being involved too late. Okay. So 
there's some real commonalities there. And so obviously the reason we're just proposing this, you know, this, this is a, a, a daily challenge for us, isn't it, Danny? So we're, we're always having to make sure we're inserting ourselves into the right conversations at the right time by following the right path. Okay, great, lovely, great ideas there. So, so just something about expectations um, that we really like uh, as a model is by an Australian consultant I've got a lot of respect called Dr. Peter Fuda. And he sort of says expectations can be divided into, into three thirds. So a third of expectations, um, expectations our stakeholders will have of us are conscious and articulated. So they're really clear with you. These are my expectations of you and you understand them and then you can fulfill them. A third of expectations are actually un unarticulated and unconscious. Okay, so they're conscious but unarticulated. Okay, so they know what they are, but they just haven't told you. And that could be for a few reasons. It could be that really, you know, your HR, you should know that. I don't have to tell you that. Or it could be, I don't really want to tell you what my expectations are. It could be that I didn't really rate your predecessor, or you know, I don't really um, trust HR. It could be a whole myriad, but they haven't articulated them, so it's really difficult to fulfil them. So we've got to find a way to articulate them. And a third of expectations are unconscious and unarticulated, which means I, I don't know what I want until I see it. So we have to find a way to work with our stakeholders to articulate these things up front, because then we're aligned and we're working towards the same goals and it's not inefficient and we build our credibility and we're supporting our stakeholder by helping them articulate what it is that they want and providing guidance on that as well. So here's tool number three that we want to share with you. And again, I said we'll share the slides with you later, but here's some questions for you to think about. So making sure how do you fall on these tests? So what understanding what are their priorities short and long term and understanding what are they actually hoping to achieve and what measures of success really matter to them? How is their success assessed? How do they like to receive their updates? Are they big picture? Are they detail orientated? And a really powerful question that we ask and we get so much information from is what don't they want to see? And that's where you get all the lessons learned from their previous things. Uh, and that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and next one is, um, have you agreed if and how you'll give feedback to each other? So that's about getting informed consent. So once you've got agreement that you can give feedback and very rarely will they say, no, you can't, um, that you, you're really clear, you've got that permission then you can then do it and vice versa. And also understanding what are their stress triggers. So as you're out in the organization and you're seeing other teams maybe cooking up a problem that's going to stress them, you can actually see these things and anticipate them and take steps to actually help them or actually starting to notice when they're falling under stress and therefore you can step in to support them at the right time. And then number seven is just understanding how they want to be involved and how often will you meet. Often this thing is really missed out. And so we get, you know, uh, infrequent communication with them. Um, and so it's about making sure there's some consistent support there and also be making sure it's just not one way. And you're really clear what you need from them, from, for me to, for you, me to serve your team in the best way. I need these things. Can you agree to them? And if you get these things up front, then you're going to go really far in it. And also that the expectations are always shifting. So it's important to keep recontracting as and when new things emerge. Okay, so hopefully that's useful. So here's some actions to improve your stakeholder relationships. So get to know the priorities, their challenges, what's keeping them awake at night and find out about them. You know, if you can, and it's not weird, get to know them as a person. Some don't want you to know about any of them, but some really appreciate it. So read the situation well. Um, two is read their business plans. Talk like you've read their business plan and read the business plans of the teams they depend on because lots of organizations have competing priorities. So for team A to achieve its priorities, this team has to not achieve its priorities. So you know what's going on and where people are focused. Three is get regular time in their diary, um, 30 minute appointments minimum. And you know just make sure these are high value sessions, a mixture of strategic, operational, you know, looking around corners, checking in on them and just get that agenda set up. Make sure you add value and then find something of value to deliver. Whatever it is, get some runs on the board, get them to perceive you as useful. So take something off them, anticipate the something, deliver something that makes and eases their conditions and you will be seen as valuable. And then also find a mentor to help you navigate the organization and system. You probably don't get time with senior people, but someone in their team or someone around can help you navigate them, what's on with their team, and help you just insert yourself in the right way that's going to add value.
So just a quick re reflection on your relationship with your stakeholders at the moment. So do you regularly contract with your stakeholders? And if you had to be honest with yourself, which of your relationships would benefit from clarifying expectations? So which ones could you actually think of putting a date in the diary to just clarify those expectations so things are crystal clear and transparent and efficient? So uh, have a moment to reflect. If, if any of you would like to put it in the comments, that would be intensely uh, uh, grateful for that. Uh, but if you just want to have a quiet reflection of yourself, you're very, very free to do that too. And we're not chatter falling, so you can just put it in whenever you wish. Okay. So it's just asking yourself, do, do you regularly contract with your stakeholders um, and which of your relationships will benefit from clarifying expectations? <laughs> I, I totally understand that. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you, Danny. Great, thanks. So now we're going to move on to part three, which is how to work with your organisation as a system. So what is an organisation system? First up, it's really important that we understand the system before we attempt to change it. So Kurt Lewin, who we said was kind of founder of OD, he said, if you want to truly understand something, try to change it. And I think all of us <laughs> have been on the sharp end, <laughs> sharp end of <laughs> trying to change a system and not Fall fully away. appreciating what we've what we've um, what we've changed. Before. <laughs> We're kind of left with the, the fallout of that. So it's important to understand every system has its logic, even if it looks completely illogical when we look at it. Everything's there for a reason, and it's important that we appreciate why things are the way they are. Things are the way they are because judgments have been made, decisions have been made, processes and policies have been put in place, and they're all there for a reason, whether we agree with those reasons or not. So there's there's built stuff that's been deliberately designed and planned in response to beliefs or situations or challenges, and then there's emergent kind of bits of the system that are kind of evolving in response to other forces at play. There's intentional things in the system and there's unintentional things. So systems are complex and the law of unintended consequences is always a risk when you start um, you know, Im impacting on something in the system. And then, you know, bits of the system are temporary and some things are permanent. Um, there'll be a dominant culture or, in the system. But, you know, if we've got a merger or an acquisition or we're bringing a lot of new hires, then that can start to affect how the system works and the culture of the system. So we wanted now to give you some models and frameworks that you can use to view systems. Yeah, so systems useful. can often seem invisible. But as Garen said earlier, we need a mental model to help us understand what's going on. So there's a whole raft of frameworks out there that can help us uh, make sense of systems. We've put some up on the screen. Again, you know, there's McKinsey 7S framework. There's Vice Board 6 Box model. There's Bert Litwin's change model. There's Galbraith Star. There's, there's Cultural Web. Barry Oshry Power and Systems talks about top, middle and bottom and customers. And then Barry Johnson talks about polarity management. So these are just there as kind of tasters, really. You can go and learn about them. Um, what's important is to pick the ones that work for you, kind mm. of spend a bit of time with them, which ones make sense to you, understand their strengths and limitations. They're all, they all have different strengths and limitations and they're all theories. The value is they just help you see a system through a different set of lenses. So, and that could help you kind of just see things from a different angle and different perspective. It's, we would really advise you to be curious about frameworks and models and just use them to, to help you look at different things from different perspectives. Yeah, I think Kurt Lewin says there's, there's nothing as practical as a good theory. Yes, yeah. So they just they just help you look at different perspectives and it stops you being myopic and blinkered and just looking at things through one lens. So um, it would be a mess of us to do a session this and not have an iceberg. <laughs> so we don't want to break with convention. So here's an iceberg model for you. Um, this is we, we talked about the importance of um, looking beneath the surface. So often there's a lot of things that happen in organizations and we, we, we do. It's very easy to deal with symptoms. So um, HR Ninjas, brilliant, brilliant site. Um, so, for example, we saw um, someone post them there and they said, does anyone have a policy for off office gossip? OK, so if you were to just implement for whatever reason, like a policy on that, then yes, it, it would potentially create a solution for it. But are we looking beneath the surface about what's actually going on there? So, um, you know, why do people feel the need to gossip? Why do they need to feel to talk behind, to share? They don't feel safe enough to share their opinions behind people's backs. So it's a, it could be a culture thing. It could be a, you know, a leadership thing. It could be a whole range of things that go on there as well. So what happens is we see the event and we see the patterns of behavior. And, and you do, as, as an OD practitioner or an HR person applying it in their work, you'll see lots of patterns and you see strange things happen. You see, so you'll see two new managers that came in from different organizations and they then adopt the same 
behaviors as the previous incumbents in that post, even though they've never met, because organization systems love patterns. So we have to understand what are the patterns we see and what are the trends. And then we need to look even deeper beneath it. So, you know, what is the system doing to influence it? So, you know, one of the most common organization designs you'll see is a functional structure. So pockets of expertise, sales, finance, marketing, whatever. Um, and that lends itself to siloed working. And Daniel will talk about this, uh, them and us thinking. Mm. Um, and so we're thinking about what's influencing this pattern. So where do we need to intervene? So if you're seeing lots of them and us, you know, do you get them in the room and then they have to sort it out? Or do we start thinking about how can we create better links between different areas of the organization? And the deeper you go down under the iceberg, the more change you can make. And this is why a lot of OD focuses at the bottom level, which is the mental model. So this is where we're trying to surface and identify people's beliefs, their values and their assumptions. And we're trying to, where appropriate, challenge them and therefore to upgrade. So a lot of reasons why change initiatives fail is because we work at task level. These are the tasks that we need to do. And if we do all these, then change will happen. But if it's often changes an ideological battle, I believe the organization should be run this way. And these people say, no, it should be run that way. And it's that's the different battle. And so it's therefore thinking about how do we open up different types of conversation and talk? So the level of the system where you intervene really matters and where you think so, you know, there's the individual level, there's between individuals, there's group, there's um, intergroup, and then there's organization. And so there's different ways of working. So we'd often say try and work at different levels when you're working with groups. So if you've got a very uh, stuck person as an individual, sometimes by changing the people around them means that they it creates court change and the person moves around the changes with them um it, you know if you've got two individuals in conflict it may well be that it's part of a bigger intergroup conflict that's going on so it's always looking at which level do i need to intervene and sometimes you just have to bring the whole system together don't you danny um, yeah we just we've just got to bring everyone together share our information share our lived experience and create a structured way of helping people change or come to some uh, form of uh, uh, you know, different way of thinking through coming together and talking. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to create sustainable sustainable change, then you often need to work at multiple levels. Just working at one of the levels isn't going to create sustainable change. No. So it's a combination. So just a very quick thing about what goes on in the room. So you, you've got a meeting, it's two managers, and you're just thinking, why can't you just agree? Why can't we just move on with this? But it's often not as simple as just two people in a room trying to work through something, these two managers. So it could be, before they go into the meeting, both their teams said, do not come back with more work for us. So it's not just about the teams are in the room, or it could be that the managers of these managers have got really ambitious agendas and saying, do not take your eye off the ball of our objectives. Do not change your plans for others. So all of a sudden they're stuck. So really, you know, do you need to intervene at their manager's level? It could be there's technical systems. One of the managers can't do it because the system's got loads of problems with it or it's got lots of legacy issues. You know, it's just it can't do those changes. Or it could be um, Danny's choice of <laughs> symbol there, the go through. It could be your predecessors. Um, and it's just, you know, the predecessors didn't get along. So these managers don't get along. Or it could be that um, a previous project happened and, you know, maybe it went wrong and maybe one of the t people had their, their people scapegoated, which happens a lot in organisations. So there's a lack of trust. And even we can get seriously psychodynamic and it could be that, you know, one of the managers has a, you can, is a huge competitive family and their brother's a high achiever and they need to achieve their goals to get promoted and therefore they've got to achieve it so they can't change their view. So, you know, we're thinking, well, this is quite common. There's a lot of people in this room. So it's always thinking about what's going on. Great. Thank you, Garen. So we're just going to switch kind of direction a little bit now and talk a bit about navigating tension. So Garen said earlier, them and us. So them and us thinking, you will all know this, is extremely common in organisations. So how often have we heard kind of the finance team saying, well, why won't they just follow the process? Um, and customer service saying, well, you just don't understand the customer won't want this. That's why we're not doing it. Um, and people and teams can be very territorial. Um, I think we've all encountered that. So it's worth recognising that them and us thinking is often just a byproduct and a trade off of organisational design choices. When we set up a functional based organisation with a sales team and a marketing team and a finance team, we create silos um, unintentionally. And that can, you know, that leads to them and us thinking we've set the organisation up in such a way that we create those those silos. 
what does that result in? Well, it means people end up feeling they're not respected by other parts of the organisation. They can feel misunderstood and unappreciated, and they can start to perceive that other parts of the organisation are acting towards them with bad intent, or they're not being sensitive, or they just deem that the other team incompetent. Or um, lazy. Or lazy, yeah. yeah. We hear that a lot. Yeah, And we hear lots of, you know, I'm right. Well, no, I'm right, and I'm right. Um <laughs> Put it in the chat if this resonates with you. I was going to say we're interested. <laughs> what examples of them and us do you see in your organisation? Or if you don't see it at all, that would be fascinating to know as well. So we'd love to hear what you. Yeah, sometimes it, them and us could be between managers and frontline people. It could be back office, front office. Again, we mm -hmm. see that quite a lot. Um, could be board versus management. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant. Thank you, Sean. Sales versus customer success. Back office, front. thanks, Alana. Yeah, so lots of really nice examples. So two teams are doing exactly the same because but went of each other. Very good, yeah. Um, all of the above, front line versus head off. Yeah, regional. Yeah. yeah, the regional model. Oh, my God, that's a that's a, a lifetime's work in there. Um, senior leadership versus all employees. Again, yeah, really common. So like with OD, it's not our job, but it is our job to notice it and do something about it. And, and HR is perfectly placed to make that difference, you know, and yeah. we, such a valid perspective because these guys it can be very myopic very easily. So it's yeah. like, how do we lift them out of that? And how do we help them abridge that as well? Brilliant. Thank you so much. Some really, really great ideas. Yeah, technical versus non-technical. We see, you know, <laughs> see that a lot. Yes, we do. Yeah. So I'm having a lot of flashbacks tonight with these comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tensions are part of a system. I think we have to accept, you know, organizations and all their messy glory. Um, we have to just embrace the chaos. It's just what happens. But there are tensions and, and HR can help. Brilliant. So clinical versus non-clinical. Great one. Mm. Um, so often you have attention. So, you know, short term versus long term, you know, do we have to deliver the number or whatever it is, but it's often at the sacrifice of the long term. So we have to find a way. It's, but often it's either or we have to decide one or the other. And so what we propose is the answer is and. So, you know, balancing the organization. So sometimes it's like, you know, to fulfill the organization's ambition, we have to you know, not to uh, pay less attention to employee needs, or it could be, you know, to win more contracts or more funding or win more sales, we have to resource it. So then there's tensions between the resourcing and the sales people, or it's also um, personalization versus standardization as well. So this is a, a really useful tool. So again, it's a good discussive tool to make, to help your stakeholders understand the tensions that they're working with and, and where they sit on that area. So you can work with them to help them articulate the tensions and also help them articulate the tensions that their stakeholders are navigating as well. So the answer to this is and, you know, if an organization only, overly focuses on short term, there won't be a long term. And if you overly focus on the long term, you won't deliver on the short term and you run out of cash or whatever it is. So it's basically HR helping them people manage those tensions. So I guess the, the thought with in the chat box is what tensions are you navigating in your role? You know, is it ethics versus speed? Is it strategy versus operational reality? Is it personalization versus standardization? Is it the organization's needs versus employee needs or automation and human interaction? That's becoming increasingly uh, a, a, a big tension. Or is it that tension between innovation and business as usual? So just if you want to um, just pop your tensions in there. So thank you, Maria. She's got a couple of tensions, strategy versus operations, employee versus organizations, ethics versus uh, politics. Thank you, uh, Katisha. Um, one culture, national versus another region. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, mm. that's a real tension, isn't it? Um, speed versus embedding things properly. Danny will talk about that in a second, won't you? Mm -hmm. um, speed versus budget. Brilliant. So rich. So yeah, the chat box is just really working well tonight. Thank you. It really is. Yeah, there's such such power in just getting those tensions out and writing them down and <laughs> having people see them. Uh, cool. OK, so now we're going to look at some of the challenges of creating change. So we talk about organizations designed to be performance engines. So ongoing operations are really focused on today's customers, on efficiency, on accountability, on you know being on budget, being on time and being profitable or, or delivering results. So that's that's kind of the organization as a performance engine. But what makes change challenging? So there's lots of things that make change challenging. And here are just six things that we wanted to highlight. So the first is that when we're making decisions around change, that you know decisions are made on imperfect information. So we never have all of the facts in front of us. Um, 
in fact if we're being pushed to make change quickly then we can have you know very few facts in front of us so that means our decisions are always going to be made on imperfect information um, we're prone to bias there's 186 different cognitive biases you know you've got overconfidence bias where we underestimate the different obstacles that we'll have to overcome to uh, achieve it or the planning fallacy where we dramatically underestimate how long something will take us to do um, and that all makes change uh, challenging doesn't it it does the other element that makes change challenging is motivations complicated so you know, if we want people to change and we need people to change, understanding what might, might encourage them to change is going to be different for every person. So different people are motivated by different things. So trying to get underneath that and understand that makes yeah. change challenging. It, interesting. There's a bit of research that says that guilt is the strongest <laughs> motivation for change. <laughs> so make of that what you will. Um, change isn't straightforward either. So sometimes change can create really emotional responses in people. But it's, sometimes it's often not about the change itself. It might be triggering something before something, a previous initiative they'd really supported or, you know, they'd lost people in previous incarnations of change before and they'd not had a chance to mourn them. So there's all types of things going on in organisations from an emotional perspective. OK, another thing that can make change challenging is what we call organisation debt. So systems get overloaded with organisation debt, and that means just over time we put in processes and procedures and policies and then they get added to and they get tweaked and over time this kind of this debt builds up and makes our, our the way the system works more and more complicated so when we then go in and try to change something about that system it becomes really difficult because it's not just changing one thing there's so many interrelated overlapping systems and processes and policies it can make it really challenging yeah and the next one which is really important is there's no such thing as a silver bullet. Often you'll hear, oh, this change is the repository for all our hope. Once it's implemented, then things will be fine. Um, they're, they're in our experience, and definitely the experience of Steve Hearson, who's doing it, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. You know, um, the, you know, there's lots of marginal gains from these different initiatives, but there often is no silver bullet. And we need to be realistic about these things. But it can be really alluring, can't it, to see, think of a silver bullet. Well, if I just do that one thing, then it's going to sort everything out. And that can be quite, quite attractive to kind of particularly the leaders and managers we work with who are in a rush and they just want that one thing. Yep. So if somebody says this is going to be the thing that's going to fix that. Um, yeah, as an HR, like, you know, what, if you can help me remove that person from the team, then it will all be OK. And it, it, it rarely is, is it, these kind of solutions? Particularly when there's patterns, organisation patterns at play, so you mm. can remove a person. But if the pattern's still at play in the system, you end up in the same situation, just with a, a different face or a different person in the seat. OK, so tool number five, we're just going to head this up reflection and sense making. So there's real power in just getting people to pause and reflect and make sense of what's going on. So just having a simple question like we're asking you what makes it difficult to initiate change in your organisation. Just getting people to stop and pause can be a really powerful tool when you're working with groups and individuals. So um, tool number six, as I said, we're going to leave you with 10 tools and we're going to finish dead on time tonight. So um, uh, is retrospectives. So all of our most of meetings and organisations are forward looking. We have a, a bias for action. Um, but retrospectives are one of the few meetings where actually invite us to look backwards. And sometimes they can feel a little bit indulgent. But if you can get retrospectives working and retrospectives come from the agile world, um, you can really build some great muscle in the team to really make improvements and keep learning. And that's part of that embedding and iterating thing. So you can actually run a retrospective in around about 35 minutes, a really good, sharp, powerful one. Um, so you, there's different questions you can ask, but here's three very simple questions to start with. So what should the team start doing? What should the team stop doing? What should the team continue doing? And so what you do is you break this into 10 minutes per question. You can do it remotely on Miro or M Mural um, or in person with lots of post-it notes. And you give them 10 minutes to tackle this, each question in turn. And then you spend five minutes at the end developing the actions from it. And you can use retrospectives to review how well a meeting's working or how well two teams have been working together in the last quarter. And those lessons are really powerful. So it means that we're, we're honoring the past to actually help shape like a more uh, efficient and effective future. So participation inclusion, we're just moving into the last section now. So inclusion is a foundation of OD. Uh, it's such an important area. Um, and a research perspective really shows the power of inclusion and how it impacts positively results. Um, OD believes that the answer is very often in the room or the system. So it's about us helping bring in marginalised voices that have insights or experience that's going to help us solve our wicked complex problems. 
So there's a belief in autonomy and giving people agency. So really making people feel that they can control the environment around them and that you can resource people to solve their own problems. So that can be really annoying for them because rather than you giving a straight answer, you're coaching them and saying, well, what options have you considered? So it's really important to make sure that people feel able, they feel resourced to actually solve their own problems. But participation yields better results than top down. So, so Paul Nutt did a 25, 20 year study on strategic decisions um, across uh, many different organizations. And he found that participative decision making outperforms um, top down decision making dramatically. So we're going to share just a, a quick range of tools and go deep on, on three of them for you. So here's some tools that we use day in, day out in our work that we really rate. So the first one is Spiral Journal, um, Conversation Cafe um, that helps spread, share a voice in the room, um, Active Listening, um, Spectrum of Support we really like, um, One Two Four we love, don't we? Uh, we use that a lot. Um, World Cafe, open space for large group interventions. There's a lot of different ones out there that are, which which really well. Danny, you're a big fan of the Meeting Canoe, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. There's a really good video on that we can signpost you to. Um, and then finally, Question Bank, which we'll share, share it through. So we'll take you through Spiral Journal Spectrum Support and Question Bank as well. So Spiral Journal, um, we've got a little facilitation guide. So when you see the slides, you can um, just go to that and that will give you a guide on it. So what you do basically, this is for when you've got a group of people that come together, they haven't necessarily developed an opinion or you just have the same voices talking a lot and some people remain quiet. So what you do basically is you get people to come into a room and you ask them just to think about the subject you're going to cover and just draw a spiral in the middle of the page for one minute. Then what you do is you then get them to divide the page into four. These instructions are so straightforward that on the guide they're all there. And then what you do is you have four quadrants. And then in silence, and the power of silence is amazing in meetings, we don't use it enough. You then ask them four questions in each quadrant. So this is an example of a session that we did the other day to um, help people take more responsibility for their relationship with their manager. So what we asked one question, what do you need from your manager to do your best work? And we gave them one minute to answer that question. What, is there anything about your leadership role that needs clarifying strategy, purpose, expectations? Um, number three is what are the big strategic or tactical issues that you feel are currently unaddressed? And number four was what can you do to take responsibility for the success of the relationship? So each of those questions is quite performative. It gets them to think in a certain way. Um, but if you follow the process, it means that then people then go into the discussion, like one, two, four, all, and they've got an opinion and they can share it much broader as well. Um, again, I know that people can't quite read the QR codes, uh, but they will be on the slide deck that come out um, at the end. Um, so you should be able to read them then. Um, decision making very quickly. So most strategic decisions fail. HR is so well placed to support them there. So one in three strategies fail to achieve their, oh, so one in three strategies achieve their objectives. 30% of employees receive no information on how to execute the strategy. This is all McKinsey research. 70% of not successful transformations were planned by fewer than 10 people. 7% um, of employees fully understand their company's business strategies and what's expected of them. And finally, 58% do st strategy top down with limited involvement employees. So you can really see the, the power of HR being involved and them being more inclusive. So here's a couple of things just to help you make that more inclusive. So we talked about the importance of deciding how to decide. Um, so this is a, a really nice um, discussion tool that you can use with teams. Um, and this is basically where you get them to decide how they're going to decide. So, for example, when organizations went into hybrid, um, a lot of the way in which they decided was um, mandate and inform. So the leader decided and then informed everyone how it's going to be. Or it was consult and decide. So senior leadership consulted to the organization, but still made the final decision. So it's just about asking your leaders, how do they want to make a decision? Do they want to be more inclusive? So as you move over the scale, it could be manager led. So the managers are actually deciding for their areas in consultation with their teams. It could be that it's um, co-created. So people co-create and the solution together, or it could be that it's self-determined. So when General Motors asked 150,000 people how they wanted to work, they couldn't get one definitive answer. So Danny, what did they decide in the end? Work where you do your best work. <laughs> So uh, so um, that's just a, a really good thing. To, so the managers are really conscious how they want to do it. And that really boosts inclusion in an organization. Uh, tool number nine, 
um, just in the last five minutes or 10 minutes now, is the Spectrum Support Discussion Tool. Um, again, really simple tool. Most decisions are binary. So it's like, are we going to do it or not? But what that means is that group dynamics come into play, because if you object to a decision, you'll often ask yourself, who am I to say no to this when everyone else agrees? So what the Spectrum Support Tool does is it just gives people more options to share their opinion from 100% support to I can support it, but I've got concerns I'd like addressed to serious objections. I've got serious objections. I'm not on board. So what it does, it just then enables you then to have a better conversation to update the solution um, uh, to actually help uh, people have better conversations and make better choices. OK, so we're on to our final tool of the night. So this is the question bank and it's one we really like. So when we work with organisations and teams, we often find that people stop. They don't ask questions of each other very, very much. They they tend to shy away from from asking questions and challenging each other. And that happens for a variety of reasons because people don't feel safe. There's not psychological safety. They don't feel they can question those higher up. They assume their their ideas have already been thought of. They're fearful of the reaction if they do ask a question or a chat or they challenge. They've tried before and no one listened. They don't want to look like they're being negative, so they don't say anything. They don't feel it's part of their role. They don't feel they know enough to question. So there's a whole host of reasons people don't ask questions. And what that means is when we're, when all teams are considering new ideas or new decisions, they don't get the inputs and perspectives from a, a variety of people. They just hear from kind of a very small number of voices, and that can have real real consequences so it actually is rocket science so NASA adopted a set of questions that they ask of every decision and every initiative they're taking following following the Challenger shuttle disaster so the Challenger shuttle exploded and when they when they went back and went through what happened to lead to that disaster they found out that people were making lots of assumptions or people had questions but they didn't feel they could ask them so they adopted a set of questions that they made it kind of part of their way of working that every time there was a decision or a, a project and under board they asked what leads you to that assumption why do you think that's correct what might happen if that's wrong what are the uncertainties in your analysis I understand the advantages but where are the disadvantages and how do you know so the question bank builds on this this concept we encourage teams to co-create their own core set of questions and that they use them every time they are working through a decision or exploring a proposal idea. So that way, if the team's got this co-created core set of questions, people who are proposing an idea know to expect these questions are going to be asked of them. Everybody else knows it's safe and expected to ask these questions. And it also builds the collective questioning muscle of the group and psychological psychological safety. So we get people to think about how's this plan going to affect the different elements of the system. So How's this plan going to affect our people, our financial performance, other teams and their work, how we work together, our customers, our stakeholders, our systems, our workflows and processes and how we communicate. So it's just a really nice tool for getting people to kind of think together, really. Um, if you download the tool using the QR code, it's got all of this in it and it's got some thought starter questions for you um, if your team need a bit of a a kickstart to help them get thinking about the questions yeah it's a really powerful tool you, you yeah. can create cultural change can't it everyone just asks yeah. better questions of each other yeah perfect and then as we said we'll give you a couple of aids to help to so we've got two playbooks one called the decision edge which is all about improving decision making and the other is all about using information to get a decision making edge um, so again you can download both of those from our website so what next so that we're coming to the end now um, we hope that you found some value. We've just wanted to share as much as we possibly can in the time that we've got to get you started. You know, these are tools that we're using as professional consultants day in, day out with our people. So they are tried and tested, but, you know, it's about you practicing with them and, and using them as well. So just some final things uh, to think about. So being an HR practitioner, applying OD skills, we're just going to share so nine tactics just in summary. So number one, tactic one, hold the mirror up to the organization. It's so powerful when you do that. Use data, use observation, use focus, whatever it is, help people understand what's going on. Invite your stakeholders to take a helicopter view, you know, help them turn out and look at the whole organization or the whole picture. Tactic three is consider the future. Help the people to think through the implications of their decisions, three, six, nine, 12 months, 18 months ahead into the future when they may necessarily can't do that. Tactic four, be the coach empower and resource people to have the conversations that they need to have. Don't build dependence on you to be the mediator. 
Tactic five, when appropriate, bring the system together. When you see different strands, bring everyone together. It's really powerful. Tactic six, learn from the past, honor the past, use retrospectives to make sure that we're building, embedding and, and iterating. Tactic seven, um, enhance the decision making. You'll see some very bad decision making around you. <laughs> Intervene. If they're only going for one option, just say, and what other options have you, have you uh, um, decided on? Um, tactic eight, spot the impact of bias and work to help people reduce it. And tactic nine, tactic nine, always get informed consent. So people actually understand the consequences of what you're proposing before they sign up to it. So that QR code that people probably can't see <laughs> just for one last time. <laughs> Um, and then that's the end of the session. So any questions in the last yeah. few minutes that we've got? And we just want to say a huge thank you to everyone. Like we really appreciate people giving up their evenings to for personal development. We we, we just completely respect it. So yeah. thank you. But and the engagement in chat's been a, been oh, brilliant. You've been a brilliant audience to yeah. engage with. So yeah. thank you. We've we've learned a lot. So thank you. Yeah.